bodies and hearts whirling, a solo melody rising out of the music of despair. And the next one is called Hand in Hand. I can't let go. There has been such a large handful of them. Let them go, rolling over and over, some with some size, bright and some blistered. I can't let them bounce, my handful, pressed open in some parts, a finger against an open handful, over each and touched, each over other, let such a large handful go, blistered in between, letting go and bounce, hold between the bounce, I can't let go. Okay, so um, this book is a collection of portraits taken, uh, uh, sort of sketches made of moments in the United States and in the UK and in France. So kind of sensory portraits of moments. Um, I'll just start reading a few here. Artist name, portrait of America, sketch, title, of the girl in the bathroom at the Montaigne's apartment, having been chased there, holding a paper flower, a sculpture for love, to love a sculptural ode. Year, dimension, medium. Artist name, portrait of America, a sketch, title, of meat has no meaning, year, set, Black into a phone earpiece, through the phone piece. Dimensions, voice, talking with Debbie. One meaning of meat is meaning. She says she is slow with transitions. Is it happening? Okay, I think it is happening. Is it happening yet? Hmm, I think it is happening. Medium. Artist name, portrait of America, a sketch, title of the roses, year, set, or dimensions, object, a bouquet of roses from Andy. Medium, concept, listen, must cut roses ends before placing in vase or will not last. Action, drooping, concept, it takes so much energy for a context to take shape for a story to form in which to have some kind of faith fact from the radio. Once a system dissolves, then the tendency is for that system to go into chaos. Every possible option is explored before another system is settled into. Artist name, portrait of America, a sketch, title, of was it this morning or yesterday morning, woke up lying there groggily, looked at dismantled fire alarm, maybe a photo and wondered what it was. There on Ruthie's wall, looked somewhat like it was winking after having dreamt. Year, set, Ruthie's apartment, giant replica of fire alarm, mechanical winking animation, dimensions, concept, excerpts from tete a tete of Simone de Beauvoir, and John Paul Sartre, kill the dream, ohm, a bumper sticker from a conversation with Ruthie regarding the idea that if you encounter the Buddha on your path, kill her or him. It had been a question prior whether dreams were a reality other than or separate from the self, but it was pointed out that the dream is the self or the mind of the self, just like the Buddha is the self, medium. Artist name, upon waking, elevators are calendars of our social discord. Title, year, dimensions, medium. Oh, uh, this is a collaboration that I wrote with my new stepdaughter, Sophie Fagan. If I can even pull it up on my, I don't even know if I can pull it up in time. Okay, it's a start. It hasn't ended yet. If we could remember, we would. We'll, well, read it again. Well, enough, a note to the future. 
Let us just think it up, plan it down to a piece of paper and just start reading it over, over a summer salad before a branch with green leaves through the window of the Hudson Diner. Another coffee, please pour rather than begin again. Now it's on the check, out with the ledger, the line is open. We bought the check, we thought the paper looked rather nice. Beautiful Frank. Um, I also I forgot uh, in terms of my script. Millions. I just want to be uh, express deep gratitude to the to the community church of Boston for letting us use this space. I mean, they do so much good work, and they have so many good people and good programs coming through here. It's 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 you know it, it's a, it's such a great space for this, and it's cooler than. <laughs> I'm also deeply grateful for air conditioning. Um, so next we have Angelo D'Amato. Hello everyone. Um, so this month uh, I'm participating in uh, Tupelo Press's 3030 fundraising event. Um, the gist of that is myself and 10 other poets have been tasked with writing a poem a day for the month of August and fundraising for the press. In exchange, they are publishing these poems on their website and their social media accounts. I bring that up because the poem I'm going to read uh, was published a couple days ago by them. Um, yeah. At the risk of sounding a little grandiose, um, the po this poem gets at something I'd like to see more of in public and public life and personal relationships. And that's, you know, admitting that you can be human and make mistakes, um, taking responsibility for those mistakes and moving forward. You know, it's just about understanding that you won't spontaneously combust if you say, yeah, I'm sorry, and admit that you're human. You know, I think it was Albert, Albert Camus who said, or actually on your phone a few days, that said, yeah, to be human, you must refuse to be a god. <laughs> Love that one. And enough of the, uh, Prologue, we're here for poetry, not prose. From among the ash heaps. One, as a child, I planted trees beside the driveway, dropped the seeds with the beginnings of a trademarked flourish. You can see it on the home video. Into a hole my father had dug. He likely patted down the dirt. Back then, I didn't like having impure fingers. Two, I visit that home in my dreams, walking down the hallway, organizing my nutcrackers for display, taking my friends on tours through a cavernous basement filled with rooms and rooms of Lego bins and Lego models, panicking that they will be broken in the moving bins. The other morning, half awake, I reached over to pull the lamp cord from the lamp that had been beside my bed. Of course, it wasn't there. And of course, I mourned. Three, it is not the thing itself that hurts, but the memories pulled in, ground up, and regurgitated in perpetuity by this thing that cannot be stifled, throttled, or soothed. Four, hellfire, dark fire, this fire in my skin, this burning desire is turning me to sin. Points to anyone who has a little bit Five. My earliest memory is of chasing after a boy in the village preschool, caught between the wall and the wooden play structure, arm outstretched, hand grasping. Six, Gatsby believed in the green light and that orgiastic future which year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch our arms farther, and then one fine morning. Seven. To every concert, on every train ride, on every special occasion, I insisted on wearing a special outfit, maroon dress shirt, black tuxedo, black vest, gold pocket watch, wide brimmed fedora, and later a cloak given to me by a girl I hoped to impress, but she saw what I couldn't. Fine clothes and fine appearances cannot make her a fine young man. Yet Gatsby insisted on standing on the dock pined himself to madness for Daisy. Eight, I told my first girlfriend I'd only been interested in 
physical stuff. And she said, I hate you as one rightfully should. I wasn't sure then I meant it, but I did feel that fire. And I cannot begin to tell how many I've burned while trying to douse the flames. Nine, so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. And 10, last June, I walked by the house I visit in my dreams. The shutters had been painted black, the gravel pathway paved, a scarlet fence with imposing wooden beams built around the backyard. The turtle shell my sisters and I had used to play in had been removed from under the deck where it had languished for years. But the trees by the driveway, how they swayed, in spite of the years, how they swayed. That's that, thank you. Okay, maybe a marathon round. Um, so this next poem is part of a larger project. I uh, started writing it after the Uvalde uh, massacre. Uh, the gist is that there's this medieval town, very peaceful. Um, the priests and the masters of the town start ringing the cathedral bells to constantly to create a constant sense of crisis to justify their hold on power. Which party am I referring to? Oh no. Um, this part of the poem is called The Masters. We masters lounge on silken thrones, rejoicing in the pops of purple grapes in our mouths. We roll rubies in our palms and tell the people, make haste, make haste, make haste, for the sun is falling soon. Make haste, make haste, hide from the light of the moon. The moon, the moon, the great unblinking eye, the moon, the moon, the master of the sky. We charm in the daytime, we dazzle at noontime, we wash our feet of filthy city grime. We give orders, we seize contraband, we point to the bells swung by calloused hands. Be grateful, O oh, impoverished you. Be grateful the Lord remembers you. But at night, in the quiet of our rooms, we lay beside our sleeping wives and remember how the gypsies trembled in their city of tombs, how the widows hissed at us beside the Marcus dolls, how the butchers rolled bloody meat into palatable flavored balls, how the eyes, the eyes, the eyes followed our swishing robes the ever watching eyes of paupers, of bakers, of midshipmen, of fiends, of courtesans and prostitutes, of failures and kings, of blacksmiths and erudite palmists, of salt farmers and polyphonic psalmists, of gardeners and goblet makers, of nobles and knights, of bishops and priests, and the hunchbacks, the hunchbacks who ring the city's bells, the hunchbacks, the hunchbacks we've spared from countless wells. They pull the ropes, they ring the bells. As the moon ascends, they ring the evening bells. The evening bells which always ring as we chew upon the day. The evening bells, the evening bells by which we cannot pray. For the hunchbacks stare with grateful, hopeful, mournful eyes. They take their rations and murmur their muffled thanks. They sprightly climb the ancient rafters they gaze upon the riverbank. They revere us, they prostrate before us, to us, this weakness is deplorable. So we beat them, we whip them, we mock them, we drip poison into their breads. And after the retching's done, still they rise and bow their heads. How we hate the lacerations on their backs and the blood upon their brows. How we leer at the burns we left when the cattle prods cooked their flesh. But the evening bells ring and ring and ring and the unblinking eye ascends. So we lay our heads upon our wives' rising breasts all hail the mercy of the hunchback. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Positively baroque. Um, next up is Tom Daly. So first of all, thanks to the organizers, Christina and Christina, Suzanne and Bridget, or sorry, Bridget, I missed now. Um, I'm going to be reading from a chapbook that recently came out from Ethel. It's a series of poems written in the wake of the death of a dear, very dear friend with whom I had become estranged in the last years. Um, 
those of you at home, I'm not wearing a balsa model of a stealth bomber. I <laughs> had some surgery for melanoma, which they cleared all up. But anyway, that's why that thing is on my nose. The first poem is called Obituary Picture. Your dear and dangerous mouth is open to the sunlight. In your red jersey and perfectly white t-shirt, you are a cardinal on holiday. No mistake that you boasted that the bishop who baptized you later elected a pope. Your teeth are touching. They might be grinding forgiveness or trust into a fine powder. You are the chosen vessel of an elixir that ferments the act of seeing into a love that scours, an infection that needles and cleanses. The angle at which your neck supports your skull leans your caution into the courage with which you withstand the sprightly chatter of the death wish. They called you the plant healer. But every fingertip that picked away the mealy bugs might later squish to soup the gnats that long to drink the wisdom from the fluid of your impatient, sun-loving <coughs> eye. The lost and found. A helicopter's propeller blades are battering the dawn. They are rifling for something on the sidewalk. But it can't be you caged in the crematorium, all your footfalls done for, all your slicing shade catalogs and chill. How, how I still summon you towards me, that noisy joy, that winking and coruscating charm, moving like a suit built from feathers, lighter than bacon, steeper than the sky, with your hip sway, girlish when you wanted it, then chainsawed under your timberline aftershave. You flounce toward me with your kindly abrasions, your mincing mischief, your sportive glee. In a club called the Lost and Found, how you held your neck stiff as a 12-inch ruler, while your hips pepper-milled the disco floor strewn with white-hot diamonds, your sneaker feet bouncing under the trampoline and the amphetamine of your smile. Infant of Prague. Climbing the back staircase after our evening swilling at the bars, your glasses off, you saw a paper bag squatting on the landing. You grabbed my hand in terror and gasped, oh my God, it's an infant of Prague. Only you could have conjured that Christ child with the orb, with the altar guild outfitted in different vestments purple for Lent, white for Easter, on a side altar in a Roman Catholic church, out of a sack someone had left on a staircase in the dim light. Only you could knuckle my funny bones so, your hand curling up, your fingers digging into my wrist as if holding on for dear life as we endured the raucous revels of the world it's blasphemous hallucinations that loosed us into a spasm of grimly glorious applause. Second Tuesday. The moon lays its sheen on the neighbor's slate roof. On the second Tuesday after your death. All the stone shingles pool in a circle of light. And the air has lost its tremor of moth. All your gone whispers are grinning me down. All your licked grimaces are ferrying me off to some speedway of snicker and frown. Riding the long root of your emptying palms, you're still waving me down from the night. Hustling me off to the highway, you row between mountains dubbed equinox and green. Over us both, the white and clamoring moon, dividing its spell from its curse. Over us both, 
the hot breath of goodbye, scalding our scalps and our wrists. Last poem, but before I read it, I just wanna say that I'm offering a special edition of Far Cry. It's called the Brain Hiccup Edition. The publisher spelled her last name twice and there are several other mistakes. I can't sell it for full price, but it's available for six dollars. Anyway. I send you off with the words of a pop song looping in my brain. Bursting behind us now, the Atlantic in late May. Your piggy on my back then, the two of us, jubilant horseshoes brawling backwards into the foam. We cross the Chesapeake to get here, spinning the long span of the bridge at break neck the words of the Starbucks song spangling our earlobes. Your smiles demure and murderously limbed. All quirk and plenteous play and never a dull boy. Never on moments not spent in the trembling delirium of your wish to resound with a spritzing blish bliss of a wave and a cock and a fist. Always and every afternoon to shimmer in the glow of your bare feet. Never a moment like this to know that the future will find us, but never let us go. Thank you. Your head's covered in the floor. It's like having it's like having a whole um, next is Salman Hussein. Hi everyone, my name is Salman. Uh, it's my first time at the Boston Post. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to the work. This first poem is called Rebro. I thought last winter would be the end for me that they'd bury me in a casket of frozen leaves. I thought that love was never meant for me, that every burden placed on me was only mine to bear mentally. I thought that all of this would get to me, if not now, then eventually. And when it hits, it's like it never leaves. And in winter, there are never leaves. But somewhere deep in the permafrost, I learned to stay soft in a world that wants to turn your heart to granite and to never take a single soul for granted and to trust in God no matter what, especially when you can't understand it. I learned to do whatever makes you feel like the most you and to never run back to what broke you. I learned that beauty fades, but not when it comes from your soul, that giving more won't ever make you feel less whole. This next poem is called 838 in Cambridge and I wrote it in Brookline, so. I have this thing, when I look at someone, I see numbers, I see time. They call it synesthesia, and you are 838, a sunrise on a winter morning, and the feeling of warmth of its gentle growth through a, frosted, through a frosted window, a sunset on a summer's eve, the blissful moments when all the troubles of the day just seem to dissipate, just before the night falls like a velvet curtain, just before the show is over, and I can't help but wonder if there will be an encore. Uh, this next poem is called The Queen. I like to reread our messages to reaffirm that you're heaven sent. Your eyes are moonlit portals that take me to places I've never been. I like to sit in the shade of your shadow and just listen to your every word, melodically pluck every fiber of my being. So speak softly to me so that your words may land on the petal of a rose and not scratch its serene skin of velvet. For even when I am not in your presence, your memories caress every crevice of, a, of my mind. And far brighter than nebulas do your eyes shine. No wonder every star in this moonlit sky bows only to you, the center of my universe, the most humble queen. This next poem is called A Letter to My Younger Self. I wish I could go back in time and sit beside you to remind you that you are so much more than what they say, remind you that you are not defined by their lies and that true beauty lies within and that the color you add to the lives you touch means so much more than the color of your skin. I wish I could hug you so tight 
and vanquish all your insecurities and remind you that no one deserves your love as much as you. Uh, this last poem is called Black, or Black Orchid. There is a part of me that longs for a comfortable life. And there's a part of me that knows when I am comfortable, I, am the, I somehow become the worst version of myself. Some plants cannot grow in a soil that is too acidic. Others grow from the concrete. I am the black orchid, and I have only ever grown when I have stood alone in the rain with no shelter but my own leaves and nothing to keep me grounded but my roots. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. I think about your synesthesia. Um, next, is, next up, we have Colleen Michaels. Thanks for the organizers. It's so great to be back in a room with poets. Yes. Really happy to be here. Morning Parade, July 4th, 2022. We are lined up at the fence like every year, but I notice not all of us take the small flags. And there's an awkward moment when the flag lady circles back to trumpet the offer again. Someone comments that the kids on the floats are throwing the candy with a new assertion targeting us with starbursts and sweet tarts. A stress ball hurled by a girl in braids is a direct, harmless hit. She smiles. For a moment, still early this morning, I let myself love a slice of America. A coach who wanted them to throw hard in this tough season, but not hurt anyone. And I've got, um, I've got my first book is coming out this year. Okay. Uh, so I'm reading a few poems from that. Um, one is called Skirt. I keep you around solely for the sound you make. Gathered at my hips and waist, so much it seems like a family reunion. Unflattering cut, shallow pocket, Blue yet gray, a graphite, hard on moleskin, unlined, my mother now blind, will soon forget my voice and words, but might remember my body as a rustle, moving in and out. And, um, I had a tough, tough, I mean, we all had tough years this past few years. And it's tough year, I couldn't walk and um, I needed surgeries and I made it through. So I'm, I'm almost dancing. Um, but, when, but when I started to like really feel sorry for myself, I thought of uh, Carol Orzel. So this poem is called, Carol Orzel donates her two skeletons to science with the stipulation that her jewelry be displayed beside them. One misspelled letter in the DNA chain instructed her soft tissue to turn to bone. What once might attach a Pandora charm now channels that a setting. And it kept repeating stones of a tennis bracelet, tendon, then bone, muscle to bone, bone on bone. She didn't waste time recounting her rare inheritance. She built tools, bought jewelry. Ribbons and sheets and plates, it pissed her off that bones seemed named like dowdy housewares in hope checks. She'd rather her doubling skeleton be a dowry of bling, single lady cocktail ring, her ossified left knee, her collarbone a pave diamond choker, a cobra brooch with ruby eyes coiled in her body. She named her pelvis statement piece. Attach the handle to a vanity mirror to show it off to herself and the medical students of Philadelphia. When her ribcage realized it was working in the surface of her F-bombs and belly laughter, it expanded as hard as it could to clear the imaginary dance floor of her heart and lungs, which she had come to think of as her cage dancer in chandelier earrings and tights. As you can see her skeleton, both of them at the Mummer 
the museum in Philadelphia. Um, but I have two more. They're short. They're short. Okay, great. So I'm um, working on a chapbook with uh, another poet or clever named Kevin Carey. And um, we've been thinking a lot about um, dated communities and big jerks and <laughs> gods and goddesses. So these are um, two poems from that collection. And this one's a, this one's um, Hestia, she's the goddess of the heart, and it's a villanelle. Origin story, Hestia, firstborn. The last spit out and the first to be born is bringing a hammer to a gunfight. Every household needs a martyr to mourn. So I'll take the obstructed view, have sworn to keep the peace on these holiday nights when they spit out orders to me, firstborn. My brother, the drunk, all siblings inborn with a meanness that bruises like peach blight. Every household needs a martyr. To mourn my siblings, I'd have to trade bud for thorn. I'd have to throw a punch, set fires all night to be the last word of fit, not the first thought born. I bring the casserole, heavy and warm. Be the change in my gate. grace journal I write. Hold onto your house. Need martyr to mourn? Choose me, the virgin, a rare unicorn who never played musical chairs quite right. The last spit out, the first to be born. Every household needs a martyr to mourn. Do I have time for one? So uh, the last one, um, otitis externa. Poseidon refuses treatment for swimmer's ear. Children won't listen and try to make a whirlpool the first time they visit someone else's in-ground. Legs like colts cutting the wrong direction through pristine chlorine. It's a form of pissing. My sons are better swimmers than my brother's kids. Part fish, they high dive, butterfly, they meddle, then high five. Marco, polo. Soon they will arrive at a grotto like Hefner's. I'll take them there. Young and slick dolphins wearing kooka necklaces and bragging about a boat that does not yet belong to them. My boat, my cigarette boat fast and loud, like a leaf blower on a Saturday. But so much cooler. Sex is a form of waterboarding, I tell my boys. Don't let up, go long, it's a swimming contest. I met their mothers in the summers of blockbuster disaster movies. I divorced the ones who closed their eyes during tsunami scenes. Tried to keep the ones who got off on cruise ships sinking. Some I asked to hold their breath underwater and wave goodbye to the ones who could beat my time, the ones I caught wincing when I asked them to slather my back with sunscreen, the ones who made a horsey noise and ate all the celery from my Bloody Mary, the ones who thought the privilege of a glass bottle on the pool deck was theirs and theirs alone, the ones who refused to pick up my towels, the ones who were cannonball near my best chair. Thank you. Love of life of America. Um, next, we have John Woodward. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, am I good? Um, this uh, first thing I want to read is the newest poem I've written. Uh, I was at a museum conference for work in June um, and attended a fascinating series of talks about exhibiting extinction, about ways that museum exhibits can um, educate the public and uh, increase understanding of the extinctions that we're living through, um, which are unprecedented, at least in human history. Um, and so one of these was about, uh, it was by Dr. Verity Burke. Um, she was talking about gorilla death masks. Apparently this is a thing, uh, gorillas, particularly in zoos, like humans, uh, it was common practice to take a death mask of a gorilla. Um, and uh, she draws a distinction between the, the mechanical nature of this reproduction, the, the, the death mask um, versus things like taxidermy and busts, which quote, use skilled artistic intervention to recall the animal to some semblance of life, 
whereas casts more often powerfully capture an animal's deadness. She advocates for using these death masks as part of exhibiting extinction. Um, so I was taking notes during this talk and a, a poem just start, started like, you know how this happens, some of, some of you, I hope. Um, uh, and I've been working on it for two months and I'm hopeful that it's finished, here it is. Um, I call it Extinction Mask Memory Exhibit. Some knowledge I gain by making, by folding the paper stork stepwise, I construct future construction. Other knowledge came which experienced no making and connects to no future and can't be brought to mind without sensing a rungless ladder underneath. And after I'd seen the giant moa rendered in resplendent red, after I'd held more closely than hope the hope of seeing the reference, one day, one moment in its future, I learned that none remained. A convulsive distress followed, which I've somehow still stopped experiencing. It just ended at some point, and for no reason. We don't retain experience, or not my experiences, not really. But I remember. But what I did with what I remember, we didn't retain that. I didn't know how common it was to take an animal, an animal's death mask to forward from just living matter, a kind of not reverse engineerable fact. Unlike more lifelike artistic interventions, casts often powerfully capture and convey to humans a human sense of animal deadness or highlight an absence of a body, yes, of a beinghood maybe, but like the exhibit doesn't end as the species does, as every species does, in an undifferentiated unsaidness, an end of blood, a not knowing how, a veil despite knowing, and maybe the mold comes off in pieces and is not all the way off yet. And maybe the worn mask is invisible. Maybe abruptly as ever, the human child projection reaches the emote animation's loop point and doesn't loop, doesn't flicker, doesn't illuminate any interior surfaces, recesses, darknesses. Um, I just had a chat book come out from the Economy Press. It's called Pool Goer and Speleographer. And uh, it's got this strange um, vertical orientation to the text. I'm going to hold up for the home viewer. You can kind of see. Um, and uh, I brought some extra copies. I, I've got three of them, and I would love to give them to uh, anyone who, who is the first three to talk to me. Um, come, come, let's talk in the break. Um, I'm excited about it. It's very weird work for me and I'm not sure how it's going to go to read it because it wasn't written to be read out loud but but I'm going to try during the next two minutes and 45 seconds. Um, Well-wisher, flattermouth, lazy bones, accessorizer, lotus eater, player of the game, binge watcher, attention seeker, busybody, doomsayer, pool goer, I should mention, I sort of had in mind that this was a self-portrait when I was writing these pieces. So I'm, I guess more self-excoriation at times. <laughs> Backstroker, pool goer, trailing droplets from pinky finger. As arm lifts and arcs over behind and dips into that buoyant future and pushes into unseen water. What matter, wave break, lighthouse, visible from space to the naked eye. I never remember beyond a torchlight flicker of a sort, a pitter patter at the other end of a sort of tunnel. Belliographer, Mapper of pustules, that's what's there. And tinnitus, that gimmicky, <laughs> fleshless, fishless, black lit from inside sound I make. I can't see where the roads are on this map. The speech of drones, a musical vacuum, serpentine or still, revelation. This too shall pass. Thank you.
done with this great. Um, next up is Josette Akresh Gonzalez. Thank you everyone for being here. <clears throat> I'm going to read two poems, one pretty short and one pretty long. Prophylactic contralateral mastectomy. That way Susanna had of cutting to the quick of an argument. Was that her or her cancer speaking? Herself turned metastatic without the least catch in her throat, actually with a brilliance that surprised us. Abrupt, her posture at the end, we're left wondering, are breasts that important? Do they make us women? Our mothers seem to always press on us as we hug, the guilt love squished between us. One of the many kinds of love, cash and birthday envelopes, Mammogram click of mother tongues, of daughter nipples, pushing through camisoles unless excised, one breast lumpy, one collateral. And we loved Susanna's new look. Striped collared shirts, black leather belt, cash in a clip. And we hung a pile of hand-sewn quilts she left us for the end. She knew we'd need them when the funeral colors faded and they lingered, one side purple and the other side yellow. <clears throat> um, this is a long poem. It's gonna take me the rest of the time to read it. Um, it's a story and uh, it's also a meditation. So feel free to close your eyes and imagine yourself. Uh, Edible on the beach. On the second Friday of August, her paycheck for this parking pass, May sucked the caramel a friend gave her on her birthday. Surprising how weed scented, down the throat slid the sweet. In the hour she waited, May thought about what she was not doing today. Often she got so angry thinking, work gets my best hours. Alert, solving problems, wording emails, but who would call it a career? The sun bellowed in her ears as a drum beat. The burst vacuum of stars ricocheted across the white tops of waves. In the ocean, the very many people, fat, hairy bellies floating on top of waves, hands just touching the surface, and a beautiful smooth-skinned ass in a thong sashaying to the water. May watched the bottoms of her feet. She could barely recall her colleagues' faces, just an eyebrow here, a leather handbag there, a cubicle, a grayish peach time capsule, trembling on her tightrope and her wet-bottomed suit. May scratched at the sand with her fingertips applying another coat of zinc to her neck, adjusting the umbrella angle, a cantaloupe colored decision that would awaken her, burst into the sun like an arc off its surface. Would anyone notice her at the greenish edge of the high tide river within which many children splashed without a care? May stepped a toe into the muck and sank, sank, sank deep, half deep into the wintry silt belly deep into the current, taken like a convict, a young bride, a cancer patient, a baby goat, a blossom, taken downriver like Joseph in his coat, sold downtown, and his father rending his garments, and his brothers washing their hands of him. May floated on her belly with her head underwater, blowing songs through her nostrils, which didn't care about spreadsheets or climate change or medicine today the exact face her boss had made, stumper. May hoped she would not bump into any children or hairy legs, popped her head up and found herself at the bridge, looked up and smelled brine mixed with acrid sunscreen, a cloud sprayed into the wind. 
spit it out. A mother of two small children glared at May. May dunked her head under. That could be me, she thought on another day, asking, do you want a snack? Instead, a glob of her own spit floated downstream, then joined the foam in a crest on the shore. May, back at her towel, dripped onto the sand, decided, I'll do as many push-ups as I can stand, rolled her eyes, collapsed on the gritty towel, cheek on the beach, said, breathe, to herself, said, breathe, became shells over time, like her parents would someday, sleep, sleep. May pushed the naughty question backward with her feet apart, looked through them, head hanging down, shook it off, Take it off, she said out loud, and then the slant raised with her eyes still shut, felt the umbrella tap her on the shoulder and blow away. Its journey punctured the sky, solitary and hilarious and crazy, bouncing along along the sand between blankets and sand castles. Oh, ha <laughs> ha, two-year-old almost got brained by its metal rod. <laughs> she laughed, gasping at the stupidly dangerous game she played. Listen to it move like a turning record, like the high soprano door Joni Mitchell walks through. The joy, the pure hazard of that open umbrella. May had lost her sunglasses in the surf, she realized. Seriously, at some point. Finally, she breathed. Finally, she prized open her cooler and began chewing salami, sourdough, and spicy mustard. Nothing like the spite of grape juice bursting out the green olive. May could live in this mouthful of brine, the gulp of iced tea. Yes, May also thought to pack a mason jar of ice, a jar of brewed jar dealing sweating in her canvas tote, and she sucked it down. Beads of sweat trickled <coughs> down her zinc neck. Where did that perfect ass go? May all of a sudden looked up, the sun a taut skin, the flesh of a flower, impatient, slick and loud, the sun gulped down her throat, piano chords heavy in her fingertips. May drank her iced tea until the last drop, some of it down her suit, between her breasts and legs. At last, she licked her lips, lay down and sighed. Her lips tasted like sand. Thank you. Thank you, Josette. And I think um, Philip Consuelos is here. Yes. So thank you to the organizers, the volunteers, uh, especially Christina, who uh, extended the uh, invitation to this Brock employee. Um, <clears throat> my father passed away, and the following year, I. Uh, made what you could say um, was a pilgrimage to his birthplace. Um, both tiny, tiny island in Greece, uh, 4,600 miles from here. Uh, the island is called Sifnos. His village was called Castro, which means uh, the castle. Uh, and it was high up on the island and it overlooked the Aegean Sea. Uh, you drove up and that was it. You had to walk. Um, into the village with no cars or anything allowed. And it was established in the 14th century. During the day, I would walk the streets, the whitewashed streets. My grandparents, my ancestors, cousins, you know, everybody walked. At night, I'd go back to where I was staying, get on my laptop. I was back in the 21st century. So it was really strange for me. During the day, I was in the 14th century. At night, 21st century wrote this poem, and I like to think the external uh, voices of my grandpa, of my ancestors helped me write this poem. And um, I think, oh, I know, um, it's a warning. Ancient ruins. A day is but a moment among ruins. Ever-changing years seem to weave a seamless continuum of unbroken time over ancient broken sites. Yet why does the earth spin on its axis along the same sunny path? Why does this globe carry all our pieces in a closed loop? Sky blue, 
and sky white mirror the sea, draw us into reflection, seducing us to delve into deep separate oceans to seek origin. But when do we truly look at each other as specimens of the species human? Are we evolving or devolving? We have our salvation and the seeds of our destruction growing within us, evolution and de-evolution at once. Scholars remind us to learn from our past or be condemned to repeat it. What have we learned of science, mathematics, religion, philosophy, and greed? Who gave us opposable thumbs to crush the future? Who gave us tools to create? Oh my God. What have we given rise to? We call ourselves compassionate, humane, and intelligent as nations lay bleeding between fingers too tiny to hold the future. Why do so many hands squeeze out innocence in the name of what deity? Why do we seek sanctuary in a time of suffering, seek safe passage, refuge, and haven, but harbor leaders who turn eyes blind or away? Does Mother Earth feel her garden grow barren as her marrow is sucked out while crimes against humanity regenerates like an infectious cancer? We cry out animal at those who do us injustice. We snivel around mouthfuls of burned fat and guzzled spirit as we dread the cries of the silence that speaks to us. Arms, arms to the poor. And just where are we on the evolutionary scale? We wonder at ancient ruins and marvel at what was. I ask you, what do such acts foretell? Will there be anything to wonder about us? I wonder today among the ruins. Um, this is just an old fashioned romantic home um, with all the upheaval we've been having. I wanted to see if I could write one. Um, and I sent it to, um, uh, we just inducted our first uh, youth poet laureate. So I sent it to her and her response was, this is adorable. So I'm like writing a romantic and I get back adorable. So I'll leave it up to you. Portals of dusty pages. I read to you in whispers. You lean against words, portals of dusted pages. This craving, encircling us with images of candle flicker, fill our breath on winter's window. Essence lingers within shadow walls. I hear Dickinson, Browning, desire echoes connecting time passages here in this moment. Their voices stir emotions within me, caressing the night on silken tapestry. I give you hot red flow on yellow parchment. Blood beats quicken, Byron, Gibran, pounding quiet serenity, anticipation as the softness of our breath quivers, listening to the rhythm that unites, inhaling the fragrance of elegant silence. We savor words breathing in the air that surrounds us, grasping at bits and pieces of syllables, heats, daffo, form round our lips. We, we taste offerings dipped in mother tongue, long stemmed flutes elicit remembrance. Our touch, our fingers ease unhinged, sensual rise, you are my poem wrapped around silken threads of feather quill. The air moves like tectonic plates, faint traces wash over us, fingers outline, lips softened with your kiss. I call to you, beloved. Eyes caress, ghost lovers give courage, receive heart. My heart flows into red parchment, this craving within, between pages, a kiss, Supple touch, gentle heart. We bid farewell, portals of dusted pages. So, last poem. So, 
Uh, I was going through a really rough time in my life. My wife had just passed away. I was uh, sitting in her chair and my cat was, well, I was sitting in my chair looking at the TV, not watching it, just kind of looking at it. Um, I was in that numb stage and my cat was in front of the TV, probably got getting the warmth from the TV, sleeping. And all of a sudden she just kind of woke up and she did that really long stretch that a cat does when it wakes up. Like, you know. So uh, that's how this poem was created. Critical recognition. I am the cat stretching, the bear emerging from hibernation, the snake shedding its skin slowly, deliberately. I am the changing seasons, sleepy winter ushering the warm tears of spring, summer solstice elongating, sun radiant, and its illumination of earth, sun, moon, share the sky, my phases, of reflecting light. I am the salmon swimming back to origin, the bird homing to womb of nest, migrating, circling back to familiarity, past the danger. The emperor penguin exhausted forever in its perilous passage, generations connected before and after. The constant ripple of a single drop of water Earth, water, air releases its memories. I call out to you, critical recognition. I am the baby stirring, the child awakening, adolescent developing, adult enlightened, the mature that exists, has existed, will exist. I am a very small drop in the liquid universe. I am the embryo of a new day. Philip has stories. Okay, and let's, let's give a round for all, all the poets. In this. this what, what a wonderful way to start. Off like an afternoon of poetry. Uh, this is just been wonderful. So, um, Elizabeth Guthrie, Angela D'Amato, Tom Daly, Salman Hussein, Colleen Michaels, John Woodward, Josette Akresh Gonzalez, and Philip Hasura. So, now we're going to break for uh, how, how long are we breaking for? Somebody can tell us. Ten, ten minutes is okay. Great. And then, then we'll 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 be back to hear Lisa DeSiro, Chad Parento, Eileen Cleary, Sarah Perlstein, Stephen Riel, Donald Wellman, and Charles Coe.